All right, let's get rolling. So you can see in front here, I've got a figure numbers with some shapes, and we're just doing a little bit of quick counting here just to get our brains warmed up. So if I look at the first one, I can see that the number of circles for the first one is two, four, six, eight, and 10. So counting those numbers should be pretty easy. Uh, what I might point out though, and this is where the arrangement of a picture can be really helpful. If you look at this, this is just one group of two. This one though is two groups of two. If we look here, there are three groups of two, four groups of two, and then lastly, five groups of two. Now why would that be important? Well, there's a couple of reasons, because I'm going to ask you for the 20th term, or the 20th figure, and I don't really want to draw all of these circles for the 20th, so I want to try and find some shortcuts. So what I can look at is figure number one had two yellow circles, figure number two had four. Well, if I start looking here and say, hey, one times two is two, two times two is four, three times two is six, all I have to do is take my figure number, multiply it by two, and I come up with the number of circles. So if I took my 20 down here and I times it by two, I should get 40 circles in that particular picture, which I'm not going to draw. You're welcome to do it if you so desire, but I'm not going to do that because that's not an efficient use of my time. Uh, where we do want to explore something in, a little more challenging though is what if I had n? Okay, and n is just some number. We don't know how many it is. Well, we would follow that same pattern. We would say it's n times 2. So the number of circles would be 2n, or 2 times n. Okay. Let's try a little bit more warm up. So now this one I've used a couple of different colors. So you'll see that figure one has three, then five, seven, nine, and then 11. Now, if I tried the strategy from the last one, if I took the figure number and times it by two, I would only get two. Well, that isn't what I need. I need two plus one more to get the three. So this is two plus one gets me three. If I try the next one and I multiply it by two, two times two is only four. But if I went four plus one, hey, that gets me to the five. And you'll notice that I've put the blue chip in there for a reason. The blue chip ends up being this little adding piece. Okay, so when I go down to find the 20th term, I know it's going to be times two again because that pattern is still evident. But now it's going to be times two but plus one more. So the 20th figure should be 40 plus one more or 41 circles. And that's a combination of yellows and blues. And if I keep that thought and I go to the n, the nth figure, which is again some number, I don't know what it is, could be really big, could be small, it's just some flexibility, it's a variable. Well I know that this is going to be times by two, but I also have to add one. So the nth figure would be 2n plus 1. And so whatever n ends up being, we just have to substitute it in for the n value, multiply by 2 and add 1, and we would have the number of chips in that particular figure. Let's just do one more, and this one's really busy and really crazy, but you'll start to see a couple things happening here. This one no longer is going up by 2s, but it's going up by groups of 4. So if we count the first value here, this is a 7, then we have 11, then we have, what's that, 15, and then 19. See, already this is starting to get 4, 8, 12, 16, 20. Oh my goodness, there's lots to count there. So there's got to be a faster way. Okay, so that's where the algebra and some of the understanding of linear relations starts to come in. You'll notice though this figure one here. If I times it by four and added three, so I'm getting the four from these four yellow chips and the three is the three blue chips which I started with in all of them. The next group here, if I went two times four and added three more, two times four is eight, that's all of the yellow ones, plus the three blues gives me the total of eleven. Okay, and you can check that out with three, four, and five. You'll see that patterns there. But again, if I want the 20th entry, 
Okay, well, I should know or be able to see right now that that's going to be 20 times 4. Okay, so 20 groups of four yellow chips plus the three blue that I have to start with. So when I multiply those out, I end up with 80 plus 3, which means the 20th figure has 83 chips in it, and there's absolutely no way I want to draw that. So if we go to the nth value, we're going to take the exact same strategy. I'm going to times it by 4. So however many groups of 4 there are. And I'm going to have 3 blue chips that I start with. So this becomes 4n plus 3. And that's a little formula that will tell me how many chips there are in whatever figure number I choose to solve for. Okay, so today we're looking at direct and partial variation. These words showed up in yesterday's lesson. We're going to define them a little bit more. So by the end of today, I'll be able to recognize the two types of linear relations. There's only two, so that's good news. Direct and partial from their respective graphs, equations, and tables of values. This is vocabulary. Pause it here if you haven't seen it. Make sure you add it to your list, but you can read it. Okay, so complete the table based on the pattern you observe and then graph the points. So I have three points here. That's the bare minimum you need to be able to spot a linear relationship. If we look at the X column, we can see negative one, zero, one. These guys are all changing by one. So the next predictable value would be two, three, and four. If we look over here, these guys are changing by plus two. So if I followed that trend, I would have 4, 6, and 8. And if I plotted those really quickly, I would have 0, 0, which is an important point. I would have negative 1, negative 2. I would have 1, 2, 2, 4, 6, 8. And now I can start to see I have a really nice linear relationship going on there. See how well I can draw freehand. Not too bad. OK, so our first differences are constant. I have a linear relationship. So if I had to make a guess on what type of equation I need here, if I looked at the values, we might notice that all of the y values are exactly twice the x value. So if my y values are twice the x value, it would read something like this. y is equal to twice the x value. And that would be my equation. And the name for this that we're going to give is going to be direct. Okay, and we'll define that a little bit more in the next two slides, but let's explore a little bit more. Oop, a little too fast. Let's go back one. Okay, complete the table based on the pattern you observe and then graph the points. So we're going to do the exact same strategy. We should see that x is just going up by ones, so that one's not too bad. Uh, again, these guys are going up by twos, but something's a little bit different here. And that little bit different is going to be right here. Okay, so when I go to plot these points, uh, I'm expecting a linear relationship, but there's going to be one small difference, and it's going to really define what this kind of graph is called. There we go. So when I graph that now, that's not too bad. Not the best graph in the world, but we'll go get with it. Okay. We need to come up with an equation that relates the x and y value. So when I look at this, I'm going to check out the other one, and I'm going to start here and think, well, there must be a twice involved here somewhere. So if I took the x values and I doubled them, well, if I doubled a 2, if I double a 2, I would get a 4. Well, I'm supposed to get a 5. So what if I doubled my 2 and I added 1. So this might be one of those relationships that we saw earlier that with the blue chips that has a starting amount already built into the problem. And that starting amount, and here's the easy place to find it, is right here. So when you find your y-intercept or wherever the x value is 0, this value in here tells you what your starting amount is. So the equation for this one would be y equals twice the x value plus 1. And I'll make a couple of highlights here just so we know where you can find these things. This 2 usually comes from your first difference. That's a good place to start looking. And the 1 comes from your y-intercept. And we will give this a name called partial. 
And one of the key pieces with partial that we want to point out, and I'll highlight on the next slide, notice right here, partial does not go through the origin. Whereas if I go back a slide, notice that direct went through the origin. So if you could take a minute, pause this. Okay, this is something you want to write down, but I'll summarize it really quickly. Direct variation is a relationship in which one variable is a multiple of the other. And we can recognize it real easy. We can recognize it because it goes to the origin. Okay, that means on its table of values, it has a zero, zero value or the graph goes through the origin. And the equation has a nice short version that looks like this. Okay, so it'll be y equals mx and m is the multiplier. So ours for the first one looks something like that. And this was our multiplier. Partial variation is a relationship in which one variable is a multiple of the other plus, and it could be subtraction, but I'm going to emphasize plus right now, plus a constant amount. Recognizable because the table of values will not go through 0, 0, will not go through the origin, and the equation will have a slightly different format. It'll have something with an adding in it. So our second graph was y equals 2x plus 1. And it's this plus right here that changes this origin piece and it turns it into a partial variation. Okay, so vocabulary again. These are from the other slide the other day. So pause it here if you haven't seen these again and take a quick read to refresh. Okay, so let's do one quick, two quick questions here. Chris runs a window washing service. She charges a flat rate of $5 plus $3 per window. So if you call Chris to clean your windows and she shows up, you owe her $5 whether she washes a window or not. If she washes one window, it's going to be the $5 plus $3 for the first window and then $3 for each additional window that she washes. So if she washes four windows, that's going to be four times three is 12, plus five more is $17. So if I wanted to graph this, a couple things, I need the number of windows, that's in the left-hand column, and that is my independent variable. Okay, My cost, which is my dependent variable, the amount or that she charges is depending on how many windows she watches, so that's why it's the dependent variable. So it will go on the vertical axis. And the number of windows goes on the horizontal axis. Now I'm just going to set this up really quickly so we can make a quick graph. Notice I can scale this out as however I like as long as I'm consistent. One, two, three, those are the number of windows. And then I could probably just use, I'll just use one square equals a dollar. There we are. So I'm just doing this really quick. 15 and then the top one should be 20. Okay, so I've set up my graph pretty quickly. If I plot those points, so I'm going to just change color to make it a little easier to see. So 0, 5. So if she washes 0 windows and shows up, she gets paid $5. If she washes 1 window and then she gets paid $8. If she goes to 2, And then three windows. Right, come on, make that dot a little bigger. Come on, computer. There we are. And then lastly, 17, I think, is there. Now what we should see is there's a pretty good linear relationship there. So let's see if I can draw a line. Oh, that wasn't very good at all. I can do better. That's better. So the quick question, is this direct or partial? Well, it's partial, and we can see that right away because it's not going through the origin. We can also see that because this is not a zero, zero entry. Okay, now if I want the equation for this, if we did a quick first differences check, and I'll get rid of this guy here so I have some room to work. If I did a quick first differences check, I would see these are changing by three. And what's really important here is these are three dollars. This is three dollars. Because this is a word problem, we have to keep track of that. And on this side, this is one window. Okay, and we'll talk more about what that means in the next day or so. So what is the equation of this relationship? Well, we know that the starting amount comes from whatever goes with the zero. 
So we're going to have a 5 involved here. And we know the multiplier is normally tied with the first difference. So the equation here would be the amount you owe Chris is going to be $3 times the number of windows plus the $5 for showing up. And that is Chris's equation. Okay, this one you're definitely going to have to pause and try. Uh, so Rana's computer service charges $30 an hour. Bill's computer repair service charges a flat fee of $25 plus $20 an hour. So that flat fee is just like uh, the previous question. If you bring your computer in, Bill charges you $25 immediately and then an additional $20 for every hour he works on it. Each company charges for parts of hours, so you ha can pay for half an hour. So to compare both companies, what variables are involved? Which of the variables is the independent and which is the dependent? Create a table of values for both. Is the data continuous or discrete? Plot both relationships on the same graph paper. And are the relationships direct, partial, or both? Okay, so pause it there. Okay, welcome back. I've got this, the answers here, so let's just go through really quickly. The variables are hours and cost. The cost depends on the number of hours of service, so it is the dependent variable. This makes the number of hours the independent variable. Okay, so if I scroll up a little bit here, Rana's computer service, I've got a table of values for her. Okay, so because she's $30 an hour, if she works zero hours, she gets paid zero dollars. Okay, and right away you can see a couple of things that tell us a lot about whether these are direct or partial. Rana's has a zero, zero entry, so we should know this is direct. Bill has $25 attached to the zero, so we know this is partial. Okay, so the data is also continuous because there can be smaller parts of the hours variable, so we could have two and a half hours. We didn't in this table of values we made, and that's okay. If we want to extend and find the equation here, so if I look at Rana's, we can see a pattern developing where uh, 30, oh, I got a couple boo-boos here. This should be 90, and this should be 120. Oops, there you are, sneaky Mr. Childs, making some mistakes. Okay, so when we look here, this one here should be 30N. Okay, and then over here for Bill, we have the initial $25 plus $20 for each extra hour he works. Okay, and this one's right. So this guy over here would be $20 times the number of hours plus $25 that he started with. Okay, and if you got those right, well done. That's some pretty tricky thinking. Okay, this is what the graph would look like. Okay, so I'm just going to scroll up a little bit so you can see a bit more. Come on there, extend the page. There we are. Okay, so Rana and Bill are both plotted. Uh, the tricky part with reading this is the lower graph is cheaper. So up until somewhere around just before two hours, Rana is actually cheaper because she's it's a lower her, her cost is lower. But after that, whatever it's 1.75ish somewhere around there, then Bill starts to become cheaper because his graph is lower. Okay, and a couple questions to try. Well done if you made it through that. That's direct and partial variation.